When he died, his eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. And uh, so on. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab thirty days, so the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. And then it goes on, Joshua takes over, and that leads us into the book of Joshua, and on it goes, and they cross over and they go into the conquest, but con- in the conquest of the land. But Moses didn't. Now, from this singular passage, there's all kinds of traditions, and it is widely believed, or was at that time, for lots of reasons, that Not only, uh, obviously, Moses, you know, the the Torah tells us that Moses was buried by God, but also out of this background came some traditions that Michael and Satan fought over Moses' body. You find that in some interesting places. The Targum of Jonathan, I'm sure all of you are diligent readers of the Targum of Jonathan. It's an obscure book that I wouldn't have gotten except by, you know, some footnotes, but this is a, a, you know, a Jewish uh, commentary. Uh, Targum of Jonathan on uh, Deuteronomy 34, 6, that the grave of Moses was given to the special custody of Michael. Ancient Jewish traditions speak of a contest about Moses' soul at the time of his burial. Now, these are traditions. And, uh, but the, these traditions appear to have a root of truth because Jude, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, makes reference to it. So don't misunderstand me. We're not basing this on the basis of some tradition. I'm just letting you know that there was that tradition. It was widely believed among Jewish scholars of this that there was a contest. Now, we know there was a contest because Jude tells us that. Which raises, really raises another question. Why did God, why does it record that God personally buried the body of Moses? That's, you know, we, I, don't, I can't think of any place else in the scripture that that is spoken of that way. Why is the place of the sepulcher a secret? Why is Satan interested in it? Now, we know he's cursed. To eat, his food is what? Dust of the ground, and you can get into a big spooky thing if you want, is what happens to the body, and you know, so forth. I won't get into that tonight. Why is Michael then dispatched to oppose? Now, if you start to put together the various, and there's been many, speculations about this, you'll find that they fall into two essential ideas, or groups of ideas. One is what might be called, what I call the fetish risk. In other words, had Moses' body and or the sepulcher been known or uh, findable, it's highly likely that they would become an object of worship. And none other than Josephus makes reference to this. In his Antiquity of the Jews, uh, volume 4, 8, 49, for those who want to take it down, he points out that Moses was so venerated by Israel that uh, if they had awareness where his sepulcher was, it would become a, a fetish, a place of worship. Now, this would be encouraged by Satan, because Satan's desire is to deceive and thwart God's purpose, and uh, a, a form of false worship would be his ambition. We find him doing that very thing in Revelation 13, verses 3 and 4, where he has a false worship of a leader. Satan's whole goal is false worship, a counterfeit situation. We're going to find out a little later, we're going to get into Deuteronomy 18, where it talks about a prophet being promised that by association the Jews look to as Moses. And I'll come back to that. Uh, so that, that's very reasonable. Now, to give you an example of where this kind of thing happened, you might turn with me uh, to 2 Kings 18.4. In 2 Kings, we have a king by the name of Hezekiah undertaking a reform. He's one of these kings, one of the few kings that really took his spiritual opportunities seriously. And in verse 4, it speaks about um, how he removed the high places and broke the images and cut down the idols and broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. Really? If, if you recall from Numbers chapter 21, God sent a plague, but he also pr- provided a remedy. And he had bro- Moses made a brazen serpent, put it on a cross, and held it up. And everywhere that looked to the serpent, the brass serpent, was saved from the plague. And uh, those that didn't died. A lot of them died. And we know because our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ makes reference to that incident in Numbers 21, because he says, As Moses raised the serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. It was a model of Jesus Christ. You mean Jesus Christ was modeled by a brazen serpent? Yes. 
Brass speaks of, it was the metal that was capable of handling heat, so it spoke of fire. Brass is, this, is, a, is a Levitical symbol of judgment. And, of course, the serpent of sin. So sin being judged is a model of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was made sin. That's exactly what the epistles, Paul tells us in his epistles. He was made sin for you and I. A hard idea to get, a, get across. Now, whatever happened to that brass serpent? It served a purpose in the wilderness. Plague went away. Everybody got healed. What happened to the serpent? They saved it. 690 years later, they're worshiping it as an idol. So that Hezekiah has to put an end to it. It says that he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it. And he called it Nehushtan. Brazen. So uh, that's an example how some of these things can become fetishes. The Shroud of Turin is an example. Poor example, perhaps. Noah's Ark. They're finding bits and pieces of it, and they become big deals, you know. So that's one theory. You can build a whole case on that. But there's another idea that I'd like to share with you, and that why is his body relevant? And that is because I think, I personally believe, there's a future role for it. And that role for it, you can say, gee, well, it's a resurrection body. Yes, I guess so, but I don't pretend to understand the physics of what's involved, and God seems to have felt it important enough that he took, took care of it. I'd like to talk about two ministries in the Old Testament that were interrupted, that were incomplete. First of all, uh, it, when we, if we go to John chapter 1, we have the story of John the Baptist. And we discover that John the Baptist had quite an active ministry, so much so that the temple heavies sent out a delegation out to the desert to find out what was going on. And in John chapter 1, in verse 19, it says, This is the witness of John, that Jews, the Jews, that means the leadership of the Jews, sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? Now, you'll discover there's three people they thought he might be. And he was none of these three. He says, I am not the Christ. John the Baptist did not make any pretense of being a Messiah. He made that clear right up front. Verse 21. They ask him then, What then? Art thou Elijah? What a strange question. Not really, because the Old Testament, the last two verses of the Old Testament, we'll look at that in a minute, predict that Elijah is going to precede the second coming of Jesus Christ. He says, I am not. John the Baptist says, I am not Elijah. There's some confusion because Jesus makes a remark about the spirit of Elijah, so to speak. And it causes a lot of confusion. But John the Baptist is right here, and there's another place I'll show you. He is not Elijah. He came in the power of Elijah. He came with a similar kind of mission, but he's not Elijah. It says, it says, Art thou that prophet? That's the third person. That's the prophet of Moses, spoken of Deuteronomy 18. The leadership at that time felt that this pretender out in the desert could be claiming to be one of three people, the Messiah, Moses, or Elijah. And he said, I'm none of those three. Well, wait a minute. That's kind of interesting. Where does he get the... Well, you, know, you mean these people are expecting? Yes. You might turn, if we will, to the last two verses of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 4. It's only a six, it's the last chapter of the book of Malachi. It's only six verses long, the last two verses. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Oh, not before his first coming. John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah, but that's another thing. There's a very specific express promise that Elijah will come before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. If you've observed Passover with the Orthodox home, you'll find that there's an empty chair left. For whom? Elijah. Should he show up? Interesting. Take it seriously. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Promise of Elijah. Now, there is a passage in Matthew eleven fourteen where the Lord says, if you could accept it, he, could have, he, he was Elijah. But they didn't accept it. It's a contrary to fact reasoning. And in, in Matthew 17, which we'll look at later for another reason, uh, he, makes a, he makes it clear that he is not. John the Baptist is not Elijah. He came in the spirit of Elijah and in a, in a royal sense, but not, not, not in the literal sense. John the Baptist was John the Baptist. 
Now, I'd like to turn, and uh, so we have Moses and Elijah being expected.